Hey, so I just want to sort of get my thoughts down in um, a sensible form. Um, I guess with HD video, I, I've been trying to mess around with the camera so that I don't look fat, but then I realized I am fat, especially since the quarantine. Oh, or us, yeah. Um, but I guess I'll, I might edit this into something watchable. Maybe. Don't count on it. Um, but I guess... Barring that, uh, this will just serve as a nice little video diary. And if I do edit it into something watchable, then great. But I just want to get my thoughts down. And I found recently, especially with this job at the this dementia ward, um, I guess talking has been my natural way of... of okay. What was that? Oh, that's the juice. Okay. Um, anyway, I, I guess I found it more natural to just talk, to put things down, as opposed to write. Um, so, I've been thinking a lot about the idea of free will and consent. Um, and obviously when you say consent, the first thing you think of is, like, sex. And while that is obviously a very important field to apply consent to, I, I've been more thinking about consent in other circumstances, you know, I, the only other time you really hear the word consent used is governance with consent of the governed. Um, oh, wait. By the way, if you can hear robotic noises in the background, that's my cat's toy. It's not a vibrator. He's, he's chasing a laser around the living room. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> the, only, the only other occasion you really do hear about uh, consent is the governance with consent of the governed. And um, it's supposed to be about sort of how our representative democracy is representative of, of the people. And I guess I've been thinking about the problems with that. Both in terms of our government and in terms of our economic system. There is no consent. Um, and that comes with a few caveats. I think consent is muddled when it comes to addiction, for one, and it is also muddled when someone's life is at risk, right? If you have a gun pointed at your head and you say yes to doing something sexual, that's obviously not consensual. That's still rape, right? Um, and a lot of stuff in our civilization can only be attained with money. A lot of stuff that you need to live. Healthcare is, is one example, but so is food and housing. And especially given the rising rent costs, that's more and more of a pressing issue. Um, and all these things, these are meaningful threats of death. And if you're currently being threatened with death, you can't meaningfully agree to something that will alleviate your chance of being killed, Right? Like, if someone says they're going to stop pointing the gun at you, again, if you do something sexual, that's obviously a bad thing. But you're allowed to enter into a contract with an employer who may have thousands of times more, like, economic resources than you, um, a huge power differential, and also, if you don't agree to some employer somewhere to get a salary... Um, you will probably die. Look, maybe there are some badasses out there, like the guy from the Primitive Technology Channel, who can successfully go out into the woods and build a clay kiln and start their own society. Most people can't. Maybe it's because we've gotten soft after the, after the Industrial Revolution, but truth be told, I, I also think it's... you. Humans have historically needed large groups of people to survive, and our civilization is just that on a macro scale. So we, we depend a lot on each other. And disconnecting from that system is not a meaningful option either. It's kind of like the um, response to... Uh, there's occasionally reactionary responses to saying America is kind of racist still. Uh, and the response is sometimes, well, if it's so racist, why don't black people just leave? Or why don't I insert minority here? Um, and the reason is, is A, that's expensive. 
B, all their shit is here. And C, all the people they like are here. Like, uprooting yourself is a difficult process. It's not an impossible one. But saying that it's an option, especially when you're talking about populations that um, one of the big parts of the problem is that they have uh, very little money. There's a lot of poverty. There's a lot of disenfranchisement. Um, there's a lot of homelessness and all, and all that sort of a lack of ability to climb up corporate ladders. Yeah. As if that's even a desirable thing in the first place. There, there are people who often can't literally could not afford to leave. Similarly, um, most people cannot afford to just disengage with civilization. Um, at least not with a size of, without a sizable group of people, and resources to take with them um, if they want a, a good chance at survival. Um, plus, it's not like there's any meaningful wilderness you could really retreat to. Like, there are national parks, but you're, there are still laws regarding them, and they're still within an existing country, and da 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 da, da. Um, So I guess what I'm trying to get across here is that economic consent should be as much of a concern as sexual consent, if not more. Don't get me wrong. Um, obviously, sexual assault is a really big deal, and it can it can ruin lives. But you spend most of your life at a career. Um, and with enough therapy, you can get over a lot of emotional trauma. But no amount of therapy is going to change the fact that, um, well... For one, you didn't really have a right to negotiate with your employer. And for another thing, um, your employer takes most of what you produce, and there's kind of nothing you can do about it. No amount of therapy can change that simple fact. It can help you accept it, maybe, but this form of abuse, um, dare I say systemic rape, although maybe that's sensationalist, this form of non-consensual arrangement, let's be generous and, and use a sanitized term here, is obviously immoral. Um, and I think a lot of people, maybe just their attention has not been brought to it, because I think when people consider these issues in clear terms, they often come to similar conclusions. It's not that people are too, God forbid, dumb to figure this out. I don't think that's the case. I think it's primarily that people are too damn tired and focused on other parts of navigating our dog-eat-dog -dog capitalist system that they really haven't had the time to think about this sort of thing. Or if they have, they have not had the power to do anything about the conclusions they've reached. So I guess I now sort of believe a lot of the employer-employee relationships in this country are at least a little bit non-consensual, at least in the way we think of consent now for sex. And I, that also applies to the government with our representative democracy. I think there's a strong case to be made that a direct democracy generally does do a pretty good job of expressing the will of the people. There are several big confounding factors in terms of actually expressing what people want in a representative democracy or a republic um, or a republican democracy, which is technically what we are uh, in America as of now. You can argue. Uh, I guess there are different classifications you could give it, but that seems the most apt one to me. Um, namely, uh, especially in a society where you can buy and sell people's attention in the form of ad space, and you can buy and sell the dispersal of information, again, through ads or um, news sources or uh, several, infinitely more channels. Um, political campaigns can essentially be won by money. Um, I think it was 91 or 93% of all political campaigns in the U.S., um, as of, I think, 2014 was when the study took place, uh, the winner was the better funded candidate. Who wins? Money. That's, that's who wins. Money. And that wouldn't even necessarily be a problem if we lived in a truly 
meritocratic society where everyone has really earned the money they have, and it's truly based on whether or not you're good people. I would still take an issue with that because I think I kind of doubt that people can have intrinsic worth greater than others. Um, people might have differing abilities. That doesn't mean that they are worth more or less than another. I, I think that whole thing is a troubling idea morally. Uh, but the point is, is in our democracy, you can essentially buy votes. And the process is a little bit obscure, but it's there. Uh, through advertising campaigns, you can influence voters' minds, or at least sway people who are currently undecided, and um, you can win elections through that. Secondly, once you're in power, um, once you've been elected, uh, you do often spend a lot of time campaigning for, or uh, canvassing, excuse me, for re-election funds. In that case, what you're often doing is sort of panhandling to either very rich private individuals or corporations or political action committees. Uh, this whole thing's called lobbying, and it sounds well and good until you realize it's essentially a form of legalized bribery, um, and one that is only really available to the extremely wealthy or to institutions which are extremely wealthy. Um, and usually those extremely wealthy institutions are run by people who are themselves extremely wealthy. So you can kind of see how there's a vicious cycle there, right? Um, the laws are essentially written by the rich because they pay for many politicians' elections, and elections can be bought and sold um, to a large extent. Not, not perfectly, but to a large extent. Um, in addition, gerrymandering, the Electoral College, our whole Congress system in general, uh, almost ensures that people do not get one vote per person per se. Um, if you live in a more populous state, you get something closer to like 0.9 votes, and that adds up. Um, whereas someone in a very low-density state like, I don't know, Kentucky, gets 2.3 votes or something... Equally disproportionate. I believe, I think there was a study done that around 16%, or maybe it was 18 somewhere very low, below 20% of the population could theoretically uh, elect a majority in, in, in the Senate. Just 18%, if it were distributed right. And that's obviously horrifying, even letting uh, putting aside the fact that politicians are often beholden to corporate and wealthy donors, the fact that an extremely small portion of people, um, just by virtue of being in the right spot or, uh, you know, uh, being in a state that's successfully been gerrymandered, um, can have such a disproportionate impact on the fate of our country is spooky and, I think, wrong. It's anti-democratic. The idea of a democracy is one person, one vote, and this violates that, plain and simple. Um, and you add to that the fact that our policy can essentially be bought and sold um, through this complicated method of lobbying. And you have something that is very straightforwardly something along the lines of a plutocratic oligarchy republic with a sort of sham process of voting. <laughs> Not to say that the parties don't have different ideas. Uh, there are differences in terms of policies that Republicans want to enact versus what Democrats want to enact. But in terms of, like, up until recently, mainstream politics, for the most part, both Republicans and Democrats have fallen into the vaguely neoliberal camp of ideas. And those ideas are just happen to be ones that tend to benefit the very rich. Not as much as fascism, though, which is why uh, a lot of people claim that neoliberal democracies, or democratic republics in our case, tend to shift right. Because there are societies that are almost de facto ruled by uh, an economic elite, people who own the means of production, uh, to use the Marxist term, but who own businesses and who are CEOs or major shareholders, and they tend to be the people with the most money. And Often, they also are the people running for Congress. I, I think it was something along the lines of 80% of all Congress people uh, are multimillionaires. I'll, I'll correct it if I ended up editing this for a video. Um, 
but they end up being our leaders and our policymakers and also, you know, have a fairly consistent, easy way to bribe our policymakers. So we have rules entirely written by the rich for the rich and in such a way that it enables fascism. Um, because in a neoliberal space, I essentially um, fascist ideas actually benefit the ruling class slightly more than neoliberal ones um, because it's sort of the structure of absolute power. Um, and often these societies also have rules about free speech, which I think is generally a fantastic thing, except when it comes to outright lies and disinformation. And, you know, this is often lies and disinformation, fascist rhetoric. Fascism involves a lot of magical thinking and so cannot be maintained without lies and disinformation. It's, um, it's a system uh, of organizing humans that necessarily makes far more sense for the people at the top than the people at the bottom. And yet, you need a lot of people at the bottom to install the people at the top into power. So, you end up needing a lot of distractions and a lot of infighting. And that's exactly what fascism does. It, it sets the lower classes against themselves with racism and religious squabbles and culture wars and all that sort of stuff. And, and, and generally, neoliberal spaces tend to do a bad job at telling those voices firmly no, shut up, that's provably false. Like, say, the most recent one was Jewish space lasers. There's a person in Congress currently in 2021. She might have resigned since then. I don't know. But she, for a while, seriously claimed that the forest fires in California, which have been caused by global warming, obviously, um, or at the very least, heat, that's what causes fire. Now, she claimed that they were due to space lasers run by the Jews, which are specifically burning down forests. Now, if that idea is no longer absurd in the future, if you're watching this video, if I decide to edit it, God help me, because that means the fascists have won. Um, that level of irrationality and magical thinking is necessary for fascism to work, because if you were thinking, like, clearly... Uh, or at least we're not uh, constantly afraid of over things like space lasers, you would realize pretty obviously that the person above you is fucking you over, and you might be mad about that. Um, now, granted, once you get far enough into fascism, you probably have a culture of discipline that, and uh, an immediate threat of death um, that might keep people in line despite that dissatisfaction. Uh, however, it is a, a self-destructive suicide cult type system, and it, it tends to not be very good at maintaining itself. Um, see, you know, Germany, Italy, Japan. Granted, there were wars, uh, but I guess Spain's perhaps a better example. I believe they mostly collapsed on their own. Um, I could be incorrect about that. But the point is, is that the current place we inhabit in the United States of America in the 21st century is I can't it's a place that claims to be ruled by the people for the people but which is very much ruled by the rich in almost every way we have a ruling class we have royalty and that's fucked up I guess I guess I feel like living in this country is not consensual. For one, leaving would be hard because no one else wants to admit Americans into their country, what with us doing a horrible job at containing this pandemic. But also, um, because I live in this country, I, it would be very hard for me to save up enough money to leave. Um I have no choice whether or not to pay taxes, and I have no choice but to agree to my employer's terms of employment, to accept their wage, whatever it is. And the result, I guess, to me, feels like a life without choice, or at least without consent. So that brings me to this other topic that I've been thinking about, which is adjacent to consent and, and, and choice. Um, 
In fact, it is sort of about that, but it's about how states of mind can impact it as opposed to external factors. Um, I think for a lot of people, it's obvious that with an addiction, people's ability to choose is limited, or at least um, the choice to stop is, is harder for them than other choices. It doesn't mean they don't have a choice per se. Uh, in fact, I think a big part of recovery is acknowledging that continuing to use the substance is a choice. But when you're in enough of an intoxicated state that often you know goes along with these addictions, um, you are sometimes really not entirely in control of your actions. You're, you're sometimes not even conscious at all, right? And going back to sexual consent, that's why having sex with someone who's passed out from alcohol is rape. Obviously. Um, although there is a sort of corollary to that, which at what point are you not able to control yourself as the person making the sexual advances? Um, because I, I almost never hear talk about when the guy is drunk and that excusing things. Uh, it's pretty exclusively when, when the woman is drunk. And I, I think that actually belies some, some sexism, um, to, to do with men being socialized to being aggressors. And, and it might even be warranted because we do live in a civilization that socializes men to be aggressors and, um, define themselves in <sighs> toxic ways. But regardless, I, I, I do think it's problematic, which I realize is just sort of a way of saying, I don't like it. Um, and it's not because I want to be able to do bad things when I'm drunk. It's more just that I think that in terms of ethics, it is something that's inconsistent. And I, I, I think the way it should be resolved is by being more understanding to everybody during intoxicated periods. Probably. It kind of depends, <laughs> right? Um, it's, it's a tricky ethical question at, the, at best. Um and so the reason I've been thinking about this is I, I listened to this fantastic YouTube documentary the other night. I made the mistake of listening to it really late at night, and I ended up staying up until like 4 a.m. because uh, it was horrifying in many ways. It's about this um, guy who, at the age of 19, after having these concussions from playing rugby and, and football um, throughout high school, uh, did some LSD with his friends. Not always a great decision if you're not in a great place. Um, he had he had depression and um, his parents were divorced, so he had some issues to work through. So the whole set and setting rule is um, he wasn't quite abiding by it. But regardless, uh, taking LSD usually is not a life threatening ordeal. In this case, um, he sort of had ended up having this god complex, and heartbreakingly. Uh, did some very violent things to his girlfriend and father, ended up killing his father and permanently scarring his girlfriend, um, all with a knife. Um, and listening to his interview, uh, or inter interrogation more accurately, in the police questioning room is downright heartbreaking. He clearly feels very guilty for what he's done, but he also feels like it was almost a separate person, like it, it, that he was hallucin he was hallucinating and that he believed them to essentially be demons um and that he was god and all this stuff that obviously doesn't make much sense when you're sober and I, you really feel for the kid but also he did murder someone and he was conscious so the question is was that him was that his choice i don't know and what the conclusion the Canadian courts came to is that, yes, it is your choice to originally drink the alcohol or ingest the substance. Um, and it was a precedent set by, uh, I believe, a drunk driving incident um, involving alcohol. Um, I'll actually, I should maybe re-record this if, if I want to edit it because uh, I'm blanking on the case and it was a fascinating one. I think it was, uh, it was essentially a conclusion to either a sexual assault or just normal assault case um, involving an ex-football player um, who was both drunk and had this cerebral damage um, due, to, due to playing uh, football. And the conclusion was essentially... 
it was more lenient, I believe, than people liked. Um, and so there's a lot of pressure for this ch- case to set a precedent of, well, you have to have some amount of responsibility. You can't just get drunk and then kill someone because how does the jury know you didn't plan to do it beforehand, right? How do they know that it was something that was truly spur of the moment? It's just contextual evidence. And granted, that's what's argued in first versus third degree murder trials, but still, it seems very relevant, especially for substances where you are, are almost literally not yourself, like your personality is different, your decision-making process is different. Um, and the defense that, well, you made the decision to ingest the substance in the first place is further complicated by... Well, what if that person has an addiction? How much of a choice is it then? And it's still a choice. It, it, it is. But how much of one? <laughs> right? Um, and I'm not excusing uh, alcoholism by any means. I, I believe that it is something that should be personally fought against and, and not enabled. But um, for a lot of people, um, getting off a substance, at least in the short term, means some very unpleasant withdrawal symptoms. Um, and it's not just for happy fun times that they take the substance. It is occasionally to actually just stave off the painful parts of addiction. Um, and that may in turn seriously shift their personality. In fact, their personality may be shifted over the course of months or years by an addiction. Is that still them? It's a little bit, uh, along the lines philosophically of the Theseus's ship, my, hmm, Thought experiment, that's the word, thought experiment, um, wherein you replace every board of Theseus' ship, and one by one, uh, at each port that it sails around to, and by the time it gets back to Crete, is it still Theseus' ship? Because you replaced every board. Um, sure, Theseus is on it, but like, apart from that, is it the same ship? Because it has none of the original parts. And a similar question, by the way, about uh, bodily continuity, as in, are you the same human being you were 10 years ago? Well, most atoms in your body get swapped out at maximum over the course of around 10 years. I believe neurons might be an exception in some cases, but um, for the most part, most cells in your body change entirely. Now, is it still the same body your head is on top of? At the, uh, supposing the neurons are the, are the only things that don't change? I think so on an intuitive level, but by a lot of definitions, it's not. (sighs) I guess all of this is to say that I think there's a real question to how much people have a choice about anything. Especially in this current, and forgive me for saying it, society. Um, (laughs) But but also in in terms of substances and in terms of your mind changing or aging or being changed by substances or a bazillion and one other factors. Where some of this is coming from is I currently work at a dementia ward. Um, I interact with people fairly regularly who used to be very high-functioning adults, like geniuses. Um, One of... The more fun patients is a lady who I will not name, but who used to be a nurse uh, as part of NASA's uh, pre-flight checkup team. Um, Very smart lady. And yet, what she talks about day to day is this teddy bear that she thinks is her son and or little brother, depending on the uh, moment, and uh, who's only one month old or maybe one year old. But who always, almost always, has gone to the moon. And she tells it like a funny story, but also a little bit like a parent bragging about a child. And it's a cute story, and it's endearing to watch her go through it. It can get tiring by the 40th sometime. Um, Just to give you an idea, there there are very smart people there. Um, And yet, they are often stuck in these cycles of thoughts or patterns of speaking that go on again and again and again and again day after day and I imagine it has something to do with the degradation of short-term memory due to dementia and something involving amyloid plaques from what I understand the research actually isn't totally there as to what the causes of Alzheimer's uh, in particular is 
Um, but the end result is I often don't, it doesn't seem like they are particularly in control of their actions. <sighs> There's a woman who I show to her room around a dozen times an hour. Uh, she wants to know where it is. It's room blankety blank. It's always been room blankety blank. And I, you know, take a deep breath and show her to it every time. And when I see her wandering around the dining hall looking for someone to talk to about this and ask like, hey, I, I want to find my room. Do you know where my room is? I can't seem to find it. It doesn't seem like she has a choice as to whether or not she's going to ask that question. Her brain is set up in a certain way. It's been refreshed as if setting on a loop, and it's in the same circumstance it was. It's sort of seeing our brains as these very, I'm not going to say rigid, they're in fact quite plastic, but um, predetermined is maybe the better word. Predetermined input-output machines, where if you didn't have memory and you were put in the same circumstance, you'd likely react the exactly same way. That might be comforting that you're, like, internally consistent. Um, but in some other ways, it's disturbing, because then what is choice? What is free will? One strong argument I heard regarding predetermination when we know the deterministic processes that happen in our brain is, essentially, we can... Choice is, by some metrics, defined by being able to predict the future and deciding whether you not or not you like a, a given projection of the future. Uh, and so making decisions based on what you think will happen, because otherwise choices are fairly meaningless, right? If you have no idea what will happen, you know, you might as well toss a dice um, then, rather than make a conscious choice. So in order to have conscious choice, you have to be able to predict the future. Not, you know, perfectly, but at least make a reasonable, educated guess as to what the consequences of a given action will be. And the argument goes, well, you have to have a, a deterministic universe in order for you to be able to make educated guesses at the outcome of something, at the outcome of a choice. And unless we lived in a predetermined universe, we would not be able to make consistent predictions because things would not react consistently. And in other words, it takes determin a deterministic universe to facilitate free choice. But the corollary to that is sort of, um, you will probably choose the same thing each time when presented with the same set of circumstances and the same set of predictions, right? Um, and that kind of brings you back to, well, what does choice really mean? Does it just mean that it's your logical estimations of the future that you get to pick between? Um, because according to that, you kind of choose the same one in the same situation no matter what. That's kind of just how your brain works. It receives an input, it gives you an output. And in fact, it tends to give you the same output a lot if you put it in the same circumstance. Um, which is not surprising in many ways. But the question then is, is what is choice? Um, because I'm not framing this particularly well, am I? I'm not setting up the contradiction here, which maybe I don't even fully understand, um, but I sense that there is a contradiction there. Um, somewhere in the fact that you can choose, sure, but your brain is a consistent enough biochemical machine that if it is put in the same circumstances, it will choose the same thing every time. So I guess, to put that in another way, it's not really swapping between different choices. Your brain is going to push you in a given direction no matter what, and that's just the nature of thought, at least as far as I understand it right now. And if that is the case, then how is that materially different than some externality forcing you to do something? 
Um, and I guess the answer is, is because at least that predetermined path is one made by your own mind. But it does conflict with our sort of standard definition of, of choice, which is that it's sort of freeing and it has more possibilities than just one route that, that will be followed no matter what. And I guess that is complicated by both observing people with short-term memory loss, dementia, Alzheimer's, and um, with substance use, especially with like very psychedelic drugs. Like um, if your circumstances change enough, you will react in ways that you otherwise would obviously not. This guy loved his dad. This guy loved his girlfriend. And yeah, he stabbed them both. Um, because he thought they were demons. Because his perception was so shifted by the drug that he was deathly afraid of them and thought it was the right thing to do to die, kill them, essentially. Um, and I guess that sort of ties into the whole memory loss argument in that if you are operating from an incomplete or warped set of perspectives... Um, then your choices might not be properly yours. I guess that's why people say informed consent. Maybe I'm just finally catching up to this idea. Informed consent. Where you know what will happen if you get pregnant. Or what it means to raise a kid. Or how much money it will cost. Or how much time it will take up to properly raise a child. Um... Maybe that's what it means by an informed consent. Well, if that's the case, then there is a serious lack of informed consent, both as people age, and when they're very young, and when they're intoxicated. And honestly, like, if someone is, is deeply misinformed, that's not that different from psychosis like if you're viewing a reality that is so absurd and obviously divergent from what we seem to be observing uh with like repeated testing and facts and logic <laughs> ben shapiro moment uh with what science and and repeated study has shown us if you are so far divorced from that that you essentially are incapable of understanding the reality that as it is um, or at least as our, we are best able to determine it, then you might as well be acting from a place of psychosis. You can make the argument. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Maybe that's a stretch. But um, if people are misinformed enough to think that there are Jewish space lasers, are, <laughs> are they really giving informed consent to any decision that they make? Um, and granted, maybe the space laser thing doesn't apply to everything in life, but like, you get the idea. If people are fed misinformation more or less constantly, and by all accounts, they seem to be uh, in some ways, particularly by places that are almost very explicitly uh, propaganda outlets like Fox News. Um, I, don't get me wrong, MSNBC, CNN, Times, BBC all have biases. And um, it's a neoliberal one as opposed to a fascist one like Fox News. But uh, at least they try to offer varying perspectives. My impression from what I've seen of Fox News, and admittedly I've tried to limit my exposure, is generally it's just people ranting at the camera. And when they're not, they are offering one-sided debates without even including the other side. Or if they do, they talk over them. And so... I don't even know if I believe in, in the neoliberal idea of fair debate because I, I'm not confident that bad ideas will always lose to good ideas or even ideas supported by evidence or ones that are closer to being logically consistent or correct. Um, and so uh, I, I'm not even sure that sort of open forum type debate is fair, but I, I would say if you do not host it, then you are pretty bluntly a propaganda outlet, one that is trying to push a very specific political view without trying to engage in discourse. And while there really isn't anything inherently wrong with that, because I'm kind of okay with it when it comes to advocating for better conditions for people, e.g. like ones attained through 
equalizing systems, like anarcho-communism, maybe, I don't know. Uh, I generally think that fascism doesn't work out well for people. I mean, I look what happened to Germany, look what happened to Japan. Um, honestly, even without the Allies' intervention, I doubt that their empires, quote-unquote, could have lasted all that long. Um, although, the like, a lot of the populations were under control during terror bombings, um, a lot of the strategy of Blitzkrieg was essentially to wipe out any potential threat um, before either the Allies could recover or before the, uh, cogent resistance movements could form. Um, and being genocidal maniacs does certainly help. Uh, if you're just indiscriminately killing civilians, if it's a wasteland, yeah, like no one can rebel, I guess. There's no one alive. Technically, that's an answer. Great job, Himmler, or whatever. Um, but the point is, is that those regimes tend to be fueled by this kind of a sputtering, seething rage that always needs a new enemy um, and appeals to emotion and an outgroup. And that is hard to sustain in times of peace. Um, look at Rome. <laughs> there was a lot of civil wars in Rome when they sort of lost a geopolitical enemy to fight um, uh, that, that wasn't inside the empire. Um, whole other topic, but very interesting, and maybe I'll go into it later. <sighs> so, I guess... I think fascism tends to result in just bad outcomes for people, apart from the whole genocide thing, which, you know, you shouldn't say apart from it, because that's pretty fucking important. It's horrifying and obviously, like, something you should take into account when considering a political ideology. Um, but uh, just even outside of that... Um, it seems like a lot of Nazi soldiers were fueled by meth. There's no real de de delicate way to say it. It was not called meth. Uh, it was called... It was it was some type of medical amphetamine. Technically, Ritalin is one. I realize maybe I shouldn't judge. Um, I do take Ritalin myself. But at the same time, it is it was closer, from what I understand, to modern-day smokable crystal methamphetamine. Um... And th that was what fueled a lot of their frothing rage. I don't know if you've ever met anyone on meth, but that, that sort of fits the bill. Um, just at least the energy and the, the potential for knee-jerk rage. <sighs> and I guess that brings into question, in turn, the whole Nuremberg trials thing. I am all for punishing fascists and Nazis. And a lot of these people had morality sy systems similar enough to our own to concretely say they should have known better. <sighs> but <laughs> if a lot of the Reich was explicitly fueled by mind-altering drugs, um, which it was, I believe there was, there was occasionally like supply line crises were involved like not getting enough meth to the front that caused the collapse of some of the units in the uh, Soviet theater. Wild stuff. I'll have to dig up the source on that, but um, interesting. But even aside from that, if they're so misinformed about everything, like one is under fascism, what is consent? What is a choice? All this is not to forgive Nazi war criminals. I'm glad they were executed. And to be honest, I think that is part of where the thought experiment ends. As in, I think it's pretty clear that even if they were misinformed, there is some part of them which had to shut themselves off to human empathy to an extent where they were okay treating other human beings like animals. Which is kind of unforgivable. Um, especially if it directly resulted in the deaths of a lot of people. I guess just in, ter in philosophical terms, it makes me wonder. It makes me wonder how much anyone has a choice, I guess. Um, a lot of us are not well-informed. I don't even know if I'm well-informed. I like to 
think I am, and I sure try to be. I try to go to primary sources and look directly at the data, but at the end of the day, those people could be lying to me. <sighs> Radical skepticism does eventually lead you back to, I think, therefore I am, and this sort of solipsistic bubble where you don't know if anything is real. And I guess if you take that to an extreme, with that, which I suppose I'm doing, um, it really does muddy the waters in terms of people's ability to choose in their lives. That's it, I guess. That's all I got to say for tonight. Um, I don't know if I'll edit this into something usable. I'll have to watch it, see if I look fat or if I sound good. Maybe I'll use Adobe Premiere filters to give myself podcast voice. Right. Well, thanks for listening. If you listen to it <laughs> and uh, if you enjoyed my ramblings, yeah, clicking the like button helps me a lot. Smash the subscribe. You, you know the YouTuber shit. You know what I mean? Um, I hope you enjoyed. And uh, if you want to talk about this stuff, I'm pretty much always in the comments. I try to respond to everyone. Um, and I'd be happy to talk about any of these subjects. I find them very interesting. That's all. Good night, folks. <laughs>